So Jason, who do you decide to treat on drugs like adjuvant ipilimumab, which is, you know, approved in the U.S. for over, I guess it's been over a year, at 10 milligrams per kilogram, which is a significant dose, but who do you decide to treat? So it's obviously a, a difficult conversation. Um, when we look at the data set from the uh, ERTC 18071 uh, study, uh, the study included all stage 3 population, and that is the approved um, uh, group of patients that could get ipilimumab. Now, in clinical practice, I, I find it's a much more fraught conversation. I, I would say that I absolutely treat patients with ipilimumab if I sort of have that sense from clinic that they have a high likelihood of recurrence, and that can be informed by several factors. But the, f the point I will make is that coming on after the discussion around the completion lymph node dissection, there's a substantial population of patients with low volume single node metastases, those are absolutely the patients I would not treat with ipilimumab, where I think the likelihood of recurrence is actually quite low, and therefore the, the toxicity profile of giving the drug in the adjuvant setting is not justified. Although, interestingly, you could think about it the other way. You could think, well, we're not doing the completion lymphadenectomy. I'm putting them at a little more risk of local regional recurrence, which I suspect we'll find in MSLT2. Maybe those are the people I should treat with adjuvant therapy. But if you actually look into the forest plots in the, in the study, it, the actual uh, benefit in terms of survival actually was relatively modest, if, if not nil, in the stage 3A population. And Jason, you're talking about not the trial that was presented today, but you're talking about the placebo versus 10 Correct. milligrams per kilogram, which showed a hazard ratio of 0 0.72. That's actually a nearly 30% risk reduction in death, which is an absolute benefit of 10%. And that was in the all stage three population, though. And if you look at the substages that drove most of that benefit, there was very, li very little of it from stage three A. No, I think we all, sorry, just one of the caveats to that trial, though, when I look at it, is the fact that the patients who were on the placebo arm who recurred, it was actually a very small percentage of them that actually went on to receive ipilimumab for stage four disease, which we know can also have a survival benefit. So I think there is some challenge to interpreting the results I, of that study. I and mean, I just have to say that in Australia, we don't have ipilimumab 10 milligrams um, reimbursed. Um, but one, even if we did, one of the things that we discuss with patients who are considering uh, ipilimumab is, well, we don't actually know whether waiting until you have stage four and treating with our best upfront Rolls-Royce treatment is better for you. Because that trial was conducted around 2008 where we had no, you know, uh, therapies available. True, but that's a tough discussion, I must say. But t so let's, let's digress for a second. You know, we heard a terrific talk today from Ahmed Tarhini from the University of Pittsburgh about early data from the uh, ecog akron 1609 study, which was a randomized, very large cooperative group study for patients with resected high-risk melanoma, giving IPI at a 3 milligram per kilogram dose, IPI at 10, or high-dose interferon. It's a study that's had at least three years of follow-up in almost all patients. So, Jason, what, what am I supposed to tell my patients based on those data? Could I safely tell patients, oh no, you shouldn't get 10 per kilo, you should get three. What, what do you tell your patients? Well, I haven't told any of them yet, but what I plan to discuss <laughs> with them um, is that um, it, it's quite clear that the toxicity is, is increased with the higher dose, and, but that's been known. Uh, I actually have to say that I feel like we still need to take a bit of a cautious approach to this data. Uh, I think we all want to rush to the conclusion that they're equivalent and therefore we can reduce the toxicity for the patients, but there is also a study in the metastatic setting that shows that there's an increased survival advantage to giving the higher dose. So in thinking about this data so far, I still haven't been convinced that I would not treat patients in the adjuvant setting with 10 milligrams per kilogram, and I think that that does remain the standard of care until we really truly see the, the readouts from that study with longer term follow -up. I couldn't agree more particularly when you look at the stage four trial and you see that the progression-free survival in the three versus ten, this is for metastatic, no difference, yet we see a 10% overall survival benefit. So here we've just seen early data on the relapse-free survival and we know for stage three melanoma that sometimes you don't start to see separation of survival curves for two, three years, which is one of the problems with the DCOG adjuvant. It is, yeah. Uh, uh, the completion lymph node dissection trial. Okay, exactly. sounds like there's a little controversy. Okay, let's hear from Mike and then let's hear from Robert. You're gonna, would you offer your patients three milligrams per kilogram based on the virtually identical three-year relapse-free survival in that ECOG 1609 study? Or are you gonna go with the standard, well-tested 10 milligrams per kilogram with a 40% rate of grade three, four immune-related adverse events. Yeah, I think actually we usually choose door C, um, which is we, again, at this point for our patients in the adjuvant setting, are really trying to get patients onto 
onto clinical trials. I mean, I think that, you know, we've seen a complete revolution in the way we treat patients with stage four disease over the last five to seven years. Um, I sort of anticipate that we're similarly going to revolutionize adjuvant therapy. Um, and so our, our, you know, really what we try to do as often as possible is to find clinical trials for patients to go on. In terms of directly answering your question, if you only have doors A and B, I agree at this point. I don't think we're ready to sort of change the recommendation for adjuvant treatment to the three milligrams per kilogram, but I do think it was quite striking how overlapping the relapse free survival curves were at this initial time point. So certainly we'll uh, need close follow-up in terms of what the maturing results from the study okay. are. Okay, so final aspect of this question is, Robert, you have to make the decision, you're the PI of the next adjuvant trial of regimen X versus regimen Y versus IPI, which is the standard. Mm -hmm. You can choose IPI at 10, IPI at 3, or you can make a dealer's choice. What are you going to do? Well, I think that <clears throat> we'll still use CPI 10 at this point in time because we have more data for that. And we also have overall survival data for that. For three uh, milligrams per kilogram, we don't have the overall survival data yet. And I think that, again, with that, this was still very early in the presentation for these patients. The one thing that I must say, Jeff, that really sort of, you know, would caution for me is that in the three milligrams per kilogram dose, there were two patients who died because of that adjuvant therapy. I think that's always a concern for us. We're, these patients do not have any evidence of disease, yet there are two patients who are dying with that adjuvant therapy. In the 10 mg milligrams per kilogram, there was actually eight patients that died because of the th therapy itself. That, to me, is uh, very concerning. So 1.6% of patients who get 10 milligrams per kilogram died because of the adjuvant treatment. The other thing also that I think that is sort of a bit perplexing to me is that if you look at the ERTC study that Jason, that you discussed, um, specifically the ones that 10 milligrams per kilogram with versus the placebo, the median progression-free survival was 27 months. Yet in this one right now, it actually is 3.9 years, which is what, 44, 45 months? So much longer. So one thing I'd like to also understand, what's the difference between the patients here? If you look at the ER2C study, actually those patients had three A patients in, that were allowed if they had a one millimeter size <coughs> metastases in the sentinel lymph node. And whereas in the uh, ECOG 1609 study, there were three Bs and three Cs in stage four and one A patients. That patient. did include stage four patients. Yes. That's correct. Mm -hmm. But again, that stage four patients was 6% and then the 1.9, so about 8% mm -hmm. of the stage four patients. A very small number of patients in the ECOG 1609 that actually were stage four. Yet, we see this vast difference in the recurrence-free survival between these two groups. And my question is, is there a difference in surgery? because much of these recurrences that we see is going to be local regional recurrences. There are differences in surgery than we see in the ERTC study and in the ECOG study, and we don't know that. But these are things that I think as we get more data from this, I think we need to really look into why, what gives a 17-month difference in uh, recurrence-free survival well, for the does same a, dose. There does appear in most of the adjuvant trials to be a not a stage migration but an outcome migration in that everyone puts together a trial at a certain point in time with expectations as to rate of relapse and survival, and it's always better than you expect, it mm -hmm. seems, consistently. And I think that we also have to question that then, sort of, can, this is recurrence-free survival. Overall survival, I would understand, Jeff, but this is recurrence-free survival. So what made that difference in that, the large difference in recurrence-free survival? So I think these are data points as we go through this that we need to, to sort of find out more about. So with that, to answer your question directly, I think that if, as we design the next study, I would still use 10 milligrams per okay. kilogram because we have more data on that at this point in time. Okay, that's, that's important information. 